to his wife. Yeah, and yeah, 1997. That was when we were the seven camp. Uh, and then in 2006, ConocoPhillips had asked if I wanted to join them in a technology group. So I was at the oil company for 15 years, um, looking at rocks and core and wireline logs and seismic data from around the world. Um, but especially in Wyoming, we did a lot of work in the Powder River Basin, Green River Basin. Um, none of that actually worked out, and Conoco has consequently quit exploring the lower 48. It's not my fault. <laughs> I said, I'm done, guys, I'm out of here. Uh, but as JP mentioned, for the past couple of years, I've been sort of freelancing. So I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Utah, and as of uh, yesterday, I'm going to be an adjunct down at the University of Wyoming as well. So I'll be doing a lot more work in the state. And what I'm going to talk about today is actually trace fossils, uh, which is burrows and worms and things. This is all from the state of Wyoming. So this is all stuff you can go out and see local. And like I said, I have some of the specimens there. Um, you know, the joke we already went through, but ichthyology is the study of fish. Ichnology is the study of traces. It's actually one of the oldest sciences. Sherlock Holmes was uh, one of the early proponents of ichnology, studying footprints and whatnot like to solve crimes. Um, acknowledgements, you know, like with everything, none of this work is mine. This work is the result of a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of things, especially thanks for you guys for showing up. Otherwise, I'd be sitting here talking to JP. He's heard all my stories, but thanks to JP for the invitation. Everybody else that's involved, you know, there's a lot of names there. Uh, George Pemberton, some of you guys might have heard of. He identified the very first Bulgaria, which if you don't know what that is now, you will within an hour. Um, a bunch of people at UW, uh, of course, my wife, Bonnie, who puts up a lot of stuff. And JP mentioned we've known each other for a long time. And we've been through some weird times. And the 90s was a weird time, and JP and I had some phases, and he liked white tigers for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got past it, we got past it. We're the, we're the people you see today. I'll be selling that later on a t-shirt. I don't be buying it at all. <laughs> so, a little bit about trace fossils, because we're going to be talking about burrows and footprints and things today. It actually is the world's oldest profession. It's not what you think it is. It's trace fossils in the oldest profession. It's because people, since we started hunting and gathering, have had to recognize where prey was. Where did the gazelle go? Where did the mammoth go? Where did the food go? And you're tracking, right? Most societies can track. We in the West are kind of unique in that we can't. Um, we've lost that because you go to the grocery store, you don't have to track down food. Um, but a lot of primitive societies, we call them primitive, they're actually probably not. Um, tracking is very important. You can see those are little petroglyphs from uh, Utah right around Moab, and there's feet, uh, you see hoof prints, so it's very important in most cultures. Uh, traditional ecological knowledge is a big source of uh, data today for ecologists. You go out to the societies where people are still living very close to the land, they know a hell of a lot more than people sitting in the research lab behind a computer, and that's true of, for example, even Wyoming, you wanna know what's going on with the prairie, go talk to a ranching family who's been living out there for a century, they'll tell you what's been happening with the ecology versus somebody that's in the lab behind a computer. Um, in the past, it's been super important. The present is very important. Ecology is a big study right now. How do you get ecosystem balance back out? Repair some of the damage that was done before we knew it was being damaged, right? So rangeland needs to be repaired because beavers were extirpated. Water table goes down, can't feed your cows. So ecology is very important. And using ichnology, for example, to study footprints and scat lets you do a survey of what animals or plants are there without actually having to trap the animal or catch them on camera. If you go out and find footprints from a a lemur, you know, you got a lemur in there, right? You don't have to actually see the lemur. Uh, forensics uses uh, ichnology quite a bit, right? S cops are always looking for people based on uh, footprints. Ichnology, uh, some insects actually leave scars on the bones and they're into a corpse, so they can identify how long somebody's been laying there by looking at the traces, the feeding traces left on the bones, for example, or the flesh. Uh, of course, the energy industry, oil and gas, geothermal, carbon sequestration, very interested in ichnology, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. The future, and what's getting a lot of uh, press these days, is it's being used in anticipation of going to Mars and other planets. Even if things don't live there now, if there was something living there in the past that left burrows or tracks or trails, if we know enough about what burrows and tracks and trails look like in the modern world, in today's world, in the past ecosystems, if you find them on another planet, you might be able to say there was life here, even if there's not now. So NASA and a lot of planetologists are getting excited for ichnology. So it's a pretty vibrant field, even though it's pretty underappreciated. And a lot of people don't know too much about it, but it's, it's an exciting field, I think. It's based on field work. Here's a colleague of mine, John Sheath. That's Glendale Reservoir. He's looking at the Sundance Formation. No bones. We didn't find a single fossil bone 
There are no shells, but we did find a bunch of burrows and trails and little resting prints. So we know there's a vibrant ecosystem happening. These are Jurassic rocks. We know there's all kinds of things living there. Not a single body fossil, lots of trace fossils. So field work is critical. A little bit about what traces are, okay? A, a trace or an ichnite or trace fossil, ichno fossil, they're basically any, any record of animal uh, substrate interaction, organism substrate interaction. So it can be things like resting traces. I mean, you can probably even guess what left that, right? You can get a pretty good guess. What, what does that look like? It's a stingray, sure. That's from South Carolina. Tide came in, stingrays were hanging out, resting. Tide goes out, they go with the tide, but they actually left a nice trail here. If you look very closely, there's bird prints. So this is telling a story. This is telling you there was a water table high enough for a stingray to swim in. Then it goes out, there's bird tracks, and there's little burrows of shrimp and clams and all sorts of things. So just by looking at the traces alone, you can tell a pretty cool story from that pile of sand. Uh, dwelling. These are crab burrows in Galveston Island. These little pellets are the sand that the crabs remove from the burrow and pile up in the mouth of the burrow. Next tide will wipe them out completely, but the burrow will survive. Uh, roots are a type of trace. Nesting, these are bank swallows. This is up in, uh, in the Canadian Rockies. Of course, footprints and feeding, like beavers. So all these are types of traces, and they're all left in the rock record. And if we know what they look like in the modern world, it helps when you're looking in a rock and say, ooh, that looks like a footprint, that looks like a burrow. And we're even leaving them on extraterrestrial bodies right now, right? So there's locomotion traces, resting traces, uh, flagpole traces, all kinds of traces. So it's really hard for an organism not to leave, leave a trace wherever it's been. They are super common in most sedimentary rocks. This, you guys have probably seen this, or at least you know, probably many of you have been here, as Dinosaur Ridge right outside of Colorado, uh, sorry, outside of Denver in Colorado. It's one of the most famous trace fossil sites in the world, is nice dinosaur tracks. They're artificially colored in black. They go out with charcoal, so they stand out a little bit more. But there's thousands of dinosaur footprints on an old tidal flat deposit. But if you go look at other rocks, this is a cross-section of some layers of sedimentary rock and mudstone. You see things like this, that, this. These vertical things are burrows. They're beetles and crayfish and cicadas uh, leave very similar burrows in floodplain deposits. These people are looking at these big load structures that a lot of geologists look at and go, oh, it's a weird sandy load. Uh, sands sometimes push down into mud and create what's called a load structure. If you look a little bit more carefully at these load structures, they have toes, the toes dig into the ground. Most geologists, especially oil company geologists, don't think in terms of uh, biology, but if you're a nerd like me, you look and go, hey, that's a dinosaur footprint. These are dinosaur footprints where when this was mud, the dinosaur stepped in, left an open hole in the mud, open hole in the mud, next flood came by, dumped a bunch of sand in, and the sand filled in the hole and created these casts. You see the exact same thing on any creek bed out here. Cows go walking by, moves or milk walks by, leaves the big mud print, the mud dries out, preserves it, the next flood comes in, fills in that stuff with sand and mud. Same exact thing. Picture that filling in over the years, piles of sediment, that's exactly what happened. That's Jurassic, that's 150 million years old. And the tracks of Denver are about 120 million years old. So trace fossils are really indicative of where you are in the world. You can actually take a step back and say, where am I? Am I on the continent? Am I in the green realm? Where am I? This is a cartoon put together in the 1960s by an ichnologist named Dolph Seilacher. He was at Yale University. Uh, I'm very jealous. My wife took a class from him. I never even met the guy. My wife doesn't really care too much about traces. She thinks they're interesting. I'm like, they're the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> she, used she, she used to go party at his house. He used to have barbecues for his students. He's apparently a great guy. Um, unless he reviewed your paper, then he was just terrible. But, <laughs> but he put together this diagram that still works today. From the 60s on, it works. Simply, all it says is in shallower water, this is a marine basin, in shallow water and coastlines, the types of burrows you find tend to be simple and vertical. Things like crabs, insects, uh, spiders, and stuff like that, make very simple vertical burrows. Dolph noticed that as you get deeper water, sort of lower energy, a lot more mud, the burrows become more complex. You start getting these horizontal things with funky shapes to them. Um, some look very geometrical, very interesting looking. Uh, and some, you know, obviously they're like little starfish. Um, 
you guys have some squid traces that look sort of like these starfish traces, and squid go down. That's all quiet, deeper water. So broadly speaking, we can, based on the types of traces we have in an ocean basin, identify if we're shallow or deep. You can and then come on the continent, and these names, Mermia, Squalenia, all that, all that refers to is the most common type of trace fossil in that assemblage. All right, it's like talking, you know, uh, swampland ecosystem, upland ecosystem, aquatic ecosystem. So each of those names there just refers to the type of assemblage of different kinds of traces. Deepest water is Nereides, Zophycos, Cruziana, Scolithos. That doesn't matter so much as just the idea that the types of assemblages you have can tell you a lot about where you are in the world, proximal distal. Where this comes in important to us is, as you know, in Wyoming, over time, seas came in, seas went out. You can do so much with sediments, right? You find a sandstone, you find a mudstone, you find a conglomerate. But you can find sand anywhere, right? Sand can go from the mountains into the rivers. You find sand. The rivers dump sand out of the delta. The sand continues down the channels of the deep water slopes, and sand winds up in the ocean basin. So the type of rock doesn't really tell you too much about the environment and the type of structures in the rock, whether it's ripples, dunes. You can find ripples here, ripples, 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 ripples. So even finding a rippled sandstone might not tell you too much about the environment, but the types of things living there tell you a lot about the environment. So from the point of view of trying to reconstruct what happened with seaways over time, knowing where you are in the world is incredibly powerful for making maps. And that's why the energy industry likes it so much. So this is a very complicated slide. All it's showing is how to go forward and backward from interpretation of the traces to the type of environment. If you think of a physical environment it's made up of uh, the types of sediment, climate, water table, salinity, whether it's fresh or salt water, oxygen content, and so on, that dictates the type of ecosystem you have, which dictates the type of organisms, which dictate the type of traces. So that all determines what kind of things are left behind. Burrows or tracks. So it stands to reason, if you can understand roughly how it goes this way, when you start finding those burrows and tracks, you can work your way backward. If you see a footprint in the snow going from a car to a house, you go, oh, that was a human being leaving his car going into his house in the snow, so it's probably cold in winter. Right? It's that simple. That's all you're doing, is just using the physical data to interpret backwards. There's a little bit of art to it, but um, you know, that's why scientists argue about stuff. It gives us a job. Um, these are all the ichnophases models, and ichnophases just means the combination of the types of traces with the types of sediment. So lots of ichnologists and geologists put a lot of time to coming up with these. They still argue about them, but roughly they work. Um, so if you find a lot of sand with cross bedding and vertical burrows, it's a scolithos ichnophases. That's what I showed you in the previous slide. So using this basic model, and the concept of working your way forward and back, that's how we use trace fossils to figure out where in the environment we are in the rock record. And they're super sensitive to environmental change. This is a core sample. So a lot of times in the oil industry or geothermal or um, uh, uh, carbon sequestration, they take a core through the reservoir rock, right? So if you're trying to find oil or an aquifer or something like that, you want to make sure there's enough porosity and permeability in the rock to hold water. Right? If you pour some water on a tabletop, it's going to spill off. You pour some water onto a piece of cement, the cement will suck it in because the cement is porous and permeable. That's how a reservoir works. This is a rock that's got a lot of burrows. These are all trace fossils you're seeing in this rock. If it was a clean sandstone, you wouldn't see any modeling at all. And if you spend as much time, <laughs> as I have staring at these kinds of things, they start to make sense. And you can start to convince yourself that this looks like almost like a little onion in cross-section. That's a type of trace fossil, it's called uh, asterosoma. You can convince yourself that you see this one up here, and there's one, two, three, it's kind of climbing up. That's a trace fossil called tychicnus. You can convince yourself you see one going across. It's kind of darker at the top, lighter, going this way. That's something called zophycus. So each of these things has its own name because that's what trace fossil specialists do. But together, they tell a story of what kind of a assemblage you have. They're in sand, so that tells you something about the environment, so it's probably a Cruziana assemblage. That's very different than something like ripple marks. I mentioned ripple marks. They're not really unique. You can find ripples on Mars, 
your gutter after you wash your car. So sedimentary structures don't tell you much. Body fossils are really cool, but they don't tell you much about the environment, right? I mean, if you have a, a dead alligator or a dead cow or a dead dinosaur, it'll drop dead somewhere. If there's any water nearby and it gets flooded or dumps itself into the water, uh, that carcass can move. And there's something called bloat and float, where an animal, as it dies, the gases start to build up in the body because the bacteria start digesting itself. And you start to fill up with gases and you bloat and you will float. So when you find these beautiful crocodilian fossils in the Green River Formation and these other areas, a lot of times they're missing a couple of bones or something's not quite right. It's because they were transported. So where that thing came to rest is not where it died. So you find this great skeleton and somebody says, hey, that's great. What kind of environment was it living in? Sometimes you don't know because sometimes that thing has been transported from where it lived to somewhere else. So body fossils aren't super helpful all the time for identifying environments, and neither are wood, leaves, seeds, and pollen. A lot of people like looking at the plants and say, that tells you about the environment. It tells you about the terrestrial environment, but again, if you're living near a river system, in a marine setting, all these plants during a storm lose leaves, lose branches, topple into the river, get dumped into the river, get flooded out the river, and come out with this big sediment cloud that's chock full of terrestrial leaves and plants and wood fragments. If you only look at the fossils and you find some floated out crocodiles and some leaves, you say, oh, this is terrestrial. But if you look at the trace fossils in those sediments, you go, wait a minute, there's terrestrial stuff that got mixed in with the marine bay. So the trace fossils are great because they're stationary, they don't move. Lots of other fossils move and give you the wrong idea. You're picking up a different signal. So these are all the types of data you can derive by looking at a trace fossil, and it's a lot we don't have to go through it all, but it'll tell you things about how, sub, how firm the substrate was. Was it a soft ground? Was it a firm ground? Um, maybe what's the temperature? What was the oxygen level like? Certain animals like certain amounts of oxygen. Some could tolerate low oxygen. And they all leave distinct types of traces. <laughs> so if you take a full study of all these things, you can start to tease out some of the environmental signals that you're seeing, the core, the outcrop. So that's, that's ichnology. That's what I do for fun. I'm married. The energy industry that I worked in for some time cares a lot because I mentioned geothermal and carbon sequestration of fossil fuel. You know, at its basis, oil and gas form where you have a lot of organic material falling into a quiet body of water. That sediment piles up in the bottom with all that organic material. The organic material gets buried, squeezed under all the pressure of all that rock. And eventually, hydrocarbons crack out. So you're basically altering a bunch of algae and plant materials, not dinosaurs like a lot of people think. So it's algae and plant material. Uh, sometimes it forms coal. Sometimes it forms gas. Sometimes it forms oil. It depends on how deep the water was, how hot it was cooked, and a variety of other environmental circumstances. To find the right kind of environment, though, the right kind of rock, you have to know where you were in the ancient world, right? I find a mud. If it's not a deep water or mud, it's probably not a good source rock for oil and gas. If I find a sand that's not connected to a good source rock, it's probably not going to have anything in it. So the energy industry is interested in knowing how deep was the water in that, when that mud formed, um, what type of sand is this, is it likely to be connected to something upstream, so when they drill a well, there's no surprises. We hate surprises. The worst thing in the world is you drill a well thinking, oh, there's going to be a whole bunch of oil, and you get nothing. And that's, that'll drive a company out of business. So the more you know about the environment, the more predictive you can be. If your well costs 10 million bucks to drill, you want to make sure you're not having too many dusters. So we're always trying to be able to predict what was the environment like that produced these layers. And that's where the trace fossils really come in handy. Geothermal, it's the same idea. This is a fairly newish technology people are getting excited about. Um, same idea, the type of rock dictates how much heat it can hold. If you pump water in to get the steam out, you want to make sure that water's not going to leak off somewhere. So you don't want a porous rock, you want something that's going to stay put. Trace fossils can help you identify what kind of rock you're in. Likewise with uh, carbon sequestration. So today, you know, with all that intro over, the problem solving with traces part of the talk is the challenge here is that there are huge discrepancies in a lot of paleogeographic maps. If you look at most um, textbooks or papers or even museum displays, you see these great maps of, in the Jurassic. This is what it looked like in Wyoming. There's a sea and a shoreline. In the Paleocene, Wyoming, you know, looked more like this. There's rivers draining out. 
Um, there's a Jurassic globe. How do we get there? How do we make these reconstructions? And there's a lot that goes into them. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, frankly, artistic license uh, by people that don't have all the data. Changes in sea level and what shoreline is doing can actually be obscured over time because the rocks, you know, sandstone kind of looks like sandstone no matter where it is. If you're not looking at the types of organisms, you might not know exactly, am I on a beach? Am I in a lagoon? Or am I offshore? If you've only described it as a sandstone, it could be any of those. If you tell me it's a sandstone with a lot of crab burrows, I go, ooh, that's a beach. If you say it's a sandstone with a lot of complex horizontal trace fossils, I go, ooh, that's offshore. So I know the beach is somewhere that way. Just super simple ideas. And again, it's not very complicated. The tools to use this, it's not a multi-million dollar drone or a fancy computer. It's to go out and look at rocks. So I'm gonna go out and look at some rocks, look at some core data, uh, and study the ichnology. I'm gonna measure sections, map key intervals, same stuff JP and the team are doing when they're looking at uh, fossils in the field. I think this thing died. Yeah. That's fine. You can hear me, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> so the, the basis of these maps is, is something like is correct? What about that? Uh, we're going to explore some of this by looking at some of the traces in the Jurassic and the Paleocene. Okay? Making maps is a very tedious process. It's not very easy. A lot of people think you just sit down with a marker, whip them out. But to make maps like this, this is 75 million years ago, here's where we are in Wyoming. 65 million years ago, about 10 million years after this, here's where we are. And by 62, in the Paleocene, there's no ocean, the ocean went away, according to these maps. All right, so I'm gonna show you some stuff that makes me think these maps are not correct, mostly from trace fossils. But to make these maps, you need to look at sedimentology, type of rock, trace fossils, but we're also talking about structures and tectonics, that's mountains, uh, the paleontology itself, types of dinosaurs, types of plants, types of mammals you find, tell you a lot about the environment, even though they might have floated out from somewhere. To do that, we're going to look at outcrops, we're going to look at subsurface data, which could be wells or seismic data, and we're going to use geochemistry, which can tell you a lot about the type of uh, organic matter and, and oxygen. These represent snapshots in time. So 10 million years passed between these two. You can't make a map for every six months in those 10 million years. So you've got to kind of average some things out. So they represent a snapshot, not a, a continuum. And it's not easy. It takes a lot of work. It takes a whole lot of uh, data. Unless you're this guy, then you just grab a Sharpie, adjust the map as you want. You guys probably remember that, right? <laughs> like, a lot of science went to the first one. Not a lot of science went to the second one. We're trying to avoid that. So with that as the background, the first question we're going to address with the trace fossils and sediments is, in the Jurassic, this is a subtle distinction, but did sea level fall? Or did the sedimentary basin get filled in with sediment? Okay. So the way to think of that is, if you have a bathtub full of water, and that bathtub, you pull the plug, the water drains out, it goes away. The other thing you can do is take that bathtub, and start filling sediment into the bathtub and piling gravel and gravel and gravel. And eventually, you fill the bathtub in with gravel, the water's gonna spill out somewhere else. It might spill out into the ocean basin. So they're very different. Are you filling in something that's a hole with water or are you draining the water? And this is, believe it or not, a big argument geologists have about a lot of these marine environments. If you're draining the water, one of two things is happening. Because in the Jurassic, Wyoming was actually connected to the Pacific Ocean. If water is draining in Wyoming, that means it was draining in the Pacific. That means it was draining everywhere. That means water was going down. Well, how do you do that? And the easiest way to do it today is to store it in glaciers. So when you have a cold environment, water evaporates, precipitates, gets stored on glaciers on the continent, and your sea level falls. Glaciers melt, that's why everybody's all upset about glaciers melting and sea level rising, because the glaciers are taking water that's on the continent and dumping it back into the ocean basin. It's happened many, many times before. It's going to happen many, many times in the future. The Florida Keys exist because 100,000 years ago, sea level was much higher, and the Florida Keys were coral reefs. Sea level fell when it got cold because we built up glaciers, and the Florida Keys emerged. Now we're going to melt the glaciers and bye-bye Keys. Then it'll get cold in the future, and hello, keys again. <laughs> That's how it goes. Um, so in the Jurassic, was that happening? Now, a lot of textbooks and, and papers will tell you in the Jurassic it was too warm to make glaciers. 
Maybe, maybe not. The other way to explain this is that sediment just came tumbling in. But there's a third way to drop sea level. Start thinking about that. We'll talk about it in a minute. So this is a time column going from oldest to youngest. It's like, you know, in your house, you come in Monday, throw your clothes on the floor. Come in Tuesday, throw your clothes on the floor. Wednesday, throw your clothes on. By the end of the week, you get a pile of clothes. You can look at the bottom and see what your first clothes were, right? Oh, well, that's Monday. Same thing with time. So we're going to be looking down here. This is the Jurassic. Later on, we're going to look up in the Paleocene. So we're starting about 150 million years ago, right there. We're going to take a field trip. We're going to go to Alcova Reservoir. A lot of you guys have probably been there. You've probably seen these rocks. It's world famous, by the way. Uh, JP and Melissa can tell you all about it. They can take you out there and show you. Uh, there's dinosaur tracks, pterodactyl tr tracks, but there's also all kinds of marine trace fossils. There's clams, worms, and shrimp burrows. It's world famous, by the way, fun story. Uh, the very first confirmed pterodactyl tracks were found at Alcova in 1977 by a junior high school science teacher who was out having a good time. <laughs> found them and said, that's kind of interesting. It looks like what's been described as pterodactyl tracks found in Arizona in the 50s. And he took them to the University of Wyoming. And back then, the 70s, the dark, dark days of the 70s, it was a lot freer. In my opinion, it was freer flow of information. So a high school science teacher went to a university and said, is this a pterodactyl? And the paleontologist looked and said, yes, I think it is. Let's write it up as a scientific paper. And the junior high school science teacher wrote it up with the paleontologist as a paper. It was citizen science in its purest form. It's kind of hard to do nowadays. There's a lot of, uh, I'm a very famous person, I can't talk to you. Back then, there's a lot freer flow of information, I think. <laughs> And that was at Alcova. So the first confirmed pterodactyl footprints, absolutely confirmed to be pterodactyls, are from Alcova. There's more to the story we can talk about later if you want. But what do these trace fossils tell us about in the Jurassic? Was sea level falling, or was it just filling in? Glad you asked. Because we can use our model from Dal Silacker and say, here's the shallow ones, here's the deep ones. Let's look at the rocks. And we'll go to Alcova, but we'll also look at Seminole and Glendome, because the same exact age of rocks exposes at all these places. If you go to Sunshine Beach at Seminole, this is it. Here's a closer look at these rocks around the corner on Sunshine Beach. There's Alcova. Here's Glendo, if you go across the marina. Now, I don't know who all in here is a sedimentary geologist, but even if you're not, do you notice a change in lithology, the rock type or rock color in these photographs? Observation is the most important thing. Whether you're a scientist or not, you can observe and see is there a color change, texture change. So if you looked at him and said, you know what, Anton, there's, there's a difference. These rocks are green. These rocks are not green. These rocks are dark, greenish. These rocks are not. These rocks are darker and eroding. These rocks are lighter. These rocks are covered up, but they're darker. These are lighter. This consistent pattern of... Now, these rocks here, I should mention, are tilted up like this. So these used to be horizontal. They've tilted up. Everywhere you look at these rocks, there's darker rocks in the bottom, and then there's a sharp contact with lighter colored rocks. There's something very interesting happening there. It's not a gradual change. It's a sharp and abrupt change. Let's look at the trace fossils we find in there. Rocks are interesting, but the traces are even more interesting. A lot of the trace fossils we find in these rocks are marine organisms. We find deep water traces, and you can kind of see a U shape here with some horizontal scratches. Here's another one, here's another one. You find those all over Glendo Reservoir in parts of the Jurassic. You find them at Seminole Reservoir. You even find a few at Alcova and Gray Reef. These are something called Rhizoperellium. It's made by shrimps and worms that live in deeper water. Russell's done some great artwork in this in the Sundance, by the way, too. He's got an awesome, it's like a 20-year-old drawing he did, but he's got the rise of Corallium and all the organisms that made these things in the Sundance formation. Because this is more of an art than a science, almost. It's true, you've got to recognize patterns. Offshore worms make these branchy tubes called chondrites. They like low oxygen, deep water environments. Shrimp make these kind of burrows with lots of scratch marks when they little deep water. At Glendo, in the blocks falling off the cliff, you see, in the rocks, you see horizontal striations, but then you also see stuff like this. And you see it here. It's not a great photograph, but I interpreted them off to the right. And those are actually 
made by polychaete worms, like that little guy in the bottom. They make Rhizocorelli and chondrites. Creepy, creepy worms that shine, by the way, it's an iridescence. If you've ever seen marine worms in the wild, like in Florida Keys, they're hor really horrifying, but also beautiful. So they're like, they're nightmare creatures because they have all these like tentacles and fangs and legs, but they're shit really pretty. And you know, side story, if you've ever seen Peter Jackson's 2005 King Kong, when they fall into the pit, there's these big monsters that look a lot like this and they eat people by extruding their stomach, grabbing the person and then sucking it back in. That's not Hollywood, that's what these things do. A lot of these worms actually find prey, and rather than just stick it in their mouth and eat it, they just stick their whole digestive tract over it and then suck it back in. And it's a nightmare, but they're kind of pretty. <laughs> so these things lived offshore in the Jurassic, but we also have ripple marks and bivalve burrows that were made by clams like that. Now, those are marine clams, they live in intertidal and tidal zones, and today they're called gooey ducks. It's spelled geoduck, but it's pronounced gooey duck. These things live like 100 or 150 years. They're ancient clams. You've probably seen the photographs, these guys holding these giant, kind of rude looking clams. Uh, that rude appendage is a siphon. So it creates a burrow where the clam's body is down here, the siphon sticks up. And if a storm comes in and washes a bunch of sediment on top of that clam, and he goes, ah, grr and burrows upward, sticks a siphon up. Another storm comes by 20, 30 years later, and he goes, ah, mm, burrows up. So he leaves a trail of himself adjusting upward. And if you've never seen these things burrow, they're pretty spectacular. Um, they're fast. Nobody thinks the clams really as fast, but watch this. It's not speeded up. This is real. And there goes a siphon, and what do I do with all the mud? There we go. <laughs> That's how they do that. It's very fast. So that's the type of clam called a razor clam. Uh, we have them all over the Texas coast. That's not my film, by the way. I found it on YouTube. Um, but you can actually see them doing this in the intertidal zone. So we have them. So we've got deep water things, intertidal, but there's nothing in between. There's none of that shallow water trace fossil assemblage. So we're going from deep, intertidal. Where's the in-between? Something's missing. We have dinosaur tracks and pterosaur tracks. Uh, JP and Melissa have been doing a lot of work on these things over the years. There's spectacular examples from Alcova, um, really great examples. And the gray is their little hands, the black is their little toes, that's at Semino. Uh, they walk like little bats. They are in that light colored sand sitting directly on top of the offshore. So we have deep water, and then we have intertidal flats. These are sauropod tracks, that's at Semino. This is drone, a uh, 3D drone model that we built. Um, doesn't look too spectacular here, but if you actually saw it rotating, you can actually see each of these footprints. Uh, and it's a trail of a big sauropod type dinosaur walk along. Is that looking straight down? I'm sorry? Is that looking straight down? Yeah, that is looking straight down, by the way. Yeah, so this is looking straight down. Here is in cross section. So these slabs fall out, and you see the surface. This, we flew the drone over the surface. Uh, so the reservoir is down here. So if I was walking, I'd be walking like this. You can actually walk on those footsteps. Don't, it's probably going to be not so great for the footprints, but, but I'm going to tell you exactly where they are, so that's okay. <laughs> so you can actually fit pterodactyl skeletons to these tracks and go, oh yeah, that fits pretty well. Um, and some paleontologists, because we're all nerds at heart, have actually done stuff like that. You can make the thing walk and say, yep, that's how they moved. Uh, I looked for a dinosaur like a sauropod, and for some reason all the footage always has them being attacked by something. Uh, so there he is minding his business and something jumps on Allosaurus. Whether a two-ton animal could leap like that, I don't know, but it's pretty spectacular. Anyway, but we have these guys sitting on top of the intertidal things, on top of offshore. So that's the Seminole Reservoir outcrop. You can see that on the road. And again, here's dark, dark, dark offshore material. This is all worms and a shrimp, and then wham, dinosaurs and pterodactyls. Same thing at Glendo. Offshore, wham, dinosaurs and pterodactyls. As a geologist, what we like is kind of things to be consistent and predictive. That profile I showed with the trace fossils, if we looked at the types of rocks you'd find, you'd see outer shelf, which is deeper water, mostly muds. Then we go from mud to kind of silt, silt to sand, it's gradual. So we're going from outer to beach, there's all this material in between. We're not seeing that in the Jurassic and Wyoming. So that stuff's missing. 
So the first hypothesis is that this stuff prograded. This is a time lapse of the Mississippi Delta. That's how it worked over time. Uh, if you want to see it again, it's kind of interesting to see it based on um, carbon dating of different deltaic lobes. Uh, this has been done by various paleo or various sedimentologists. Oops. Um, so watch it again, like over 10,000 years, that's how it prograded. And now it's kind of retreating because sea level's rising. But most importantly, sediment has been cut off because the Army Corps engineers decided we don't want to flood New Orleans. We're going to build levees. We're going to stop sediment and water from flooding. How do you keep a delta above ground? The delta is naturally going to compact. Well, you let it flood and the sediment and water come in. No, no, no. Flooding is bad. We can't flood New Orleans. Consequently, the delta is compacting under its own weight. And sea level's rising. But there's another problem, too. <laughs> I mentioned glaciers. In the Pleistocene, let's say this is North America. Let's make this north, that's south. You guys might remember from Earth science, there's a mantle under a crust, and the mantle is liquid. So Earth's crust floats on a liquid mantle. If I put some heavy weight from glaciers in Canada and North America, it pushes up the southern part of the U.S. So the Gulf Coast actually got pushed up in the Pleistocene. Since the Pleistocene 10,000 years ago, those glaciers have been melting and retreating. So North America has actually been cantilevering back down. So if you live in New Orleans, you've got a triple whammy. You've got the entire North American continent has been sagging back down, but sea level is also rising, and the Corps of Engineers decided we don't want to allow any more sediment to come in. So you're just doomed living on the Gulf Coast. That's your lesson on, on coast, coastal morphology for today. But using this again, you know, here's that predictive shallow to deeper to deep. We're missing this part again in the Jurassic. Bad model. We don't like it. <laughs> the second hypothesis is did sea level actually fall based on what we're seeing in the traces? Now there's, I mentioned three possible ways of doing that. What I didn't tell you is that mountains building can actually make sea level look like it's falling. Now in the Jurassic, Mountains were going up throughout the western interior, so the front range of Colorado was up in the Jurassic. It started raising. So if you're living, let's say, in Wyoming or Colorado, and then a million years later, if your land starts to go up, if you're a dinosaur standing here and you live a long time, you go, wow, sea level really fell. From your perspective, it did. It didn't. The mountains rose up. The land rose up. If you don't believe that happens, Go to the coast of Alaska or the coast of Washington State or Oregon or California. Every time they have an earthquake that shifts the land upward a little bit, people look and go, wait a minute, that cliff didn't used to be that tall. Your land has been lifted up. Sea level didn't go down, your land lifted up. The result in terms of sediments, and again, these are, let's say, vertical logs or core or an outcrop, you would expect in a normal condition to see mud, to silt, to a little bit of sand, to more sand, to all sand. In a situation like this, where sea levels forced down, you get mud, boom, sand. Ah, that's what we saw at Glendo and Seminole and Alcoa. So what we saw is the result of something similar to this, where sea level was forced down. It didn't go down, sediment didn't fill it in. It was forced, maybe by tectonic uplift. So we get something like that. There is a Glendo. Don't you know, I didn't draw these, these from various papers from 20, 30, 40 years ago. That matches exactly what we see. So it was what's called a forced regression. Yeah, Al Bundy agrees. <laughs> so to make a map, we incorporate all that data and say, looking at the types of sediments, looking at the ancestral front range here, and a lot of data went through it, so I didn't go through all this. But trust me, it's there. Um, there's windblown sand dunes in Colorado. There's no sediment of this age preserved in this part of Colorado and Wyoming because it was stripped away when the mountains came up and all the sediment got peeled off. There's younger Cretaceous sediment because as the basin filled with more sediment, it covered the mountains. But at this time, those mountains were up. They weren't catching sediment. There's lake deposits. There's this tidal deposit with all the pterodactyl footprints. And there's carbonate dunes. If you go up to Thermopolis and you go up to the Bighorn Basin, Time equivalent deposits to this are made up of sand, but it's not quartz sand, it's sand made out of busted up shells. It's all bivalve shells and gastropod shells, just like you see in like the Bahamas. 
So you can envision this environment where you have beaches here, the mountains are coming up, the Bahamas are out here, but there was also mountains building up near, uh, near Thermopolis, the Wind River Basin. These mountains started coming up, so the result was over time, the seaway was forced out. So the seaway didn't drain, the seaway was not filled in, the land actually physically lifted up and forced the seaway down. That's kind of cool. And the trace fossils and the sediments all together tell you that story. So we have evidence, and there's other reasons to think the Jurassic Mountain building was happening, but we have really good evidence now that it was Jurassic Mountain building a lot earlier than most paleogeographic labs would tell you. Here's a really complex diagram that shows you from earliest to the latest, but basically it's blue line is sea level. In all four of these diagrams, sea level's at the exact same spot. I haven't changed it. What I did in each of these four diagrams is I progressively lifted up different parts of the land, but look where sea level goes. It goes from all the way here to now it marches out, and then it marches out to here, and then it marches out to here. But sea level didn't fall. I've just raised everything else. So you can actually raise up land and it gives the appearance of sea level falling. And each of those red marks represents one of the spots where uh, the crew I work with, we've gone out and measured sections and got trace fossils and sediments and all that sort of stuff. So let's jump about 90 million years later than that. So we're gonna to go to the Paleocene up there. So we're about 65, 60, 58 million years ago. The dinosaurs were long gone. Mammals took over. Mountains were building a lot faster and the Western Interior Seaway was about to be gone forever. Wyoming had a really long history of being marine. After this, it was never marine again. Oh, I should mention too, uh, this is Seminole Reservoir. And the Jurassic rocks I was just telling you about are up here, uh, but there's also all these great Paleocene rocks, and this is what we're going to be talking about now. So question two is, when and how did the sea retreat? These are two maps drawn by two different people representing the exact same time period. <laughs> this person said, there's no sea anywhere. These Multiple co-authors said there is a sea, and it came up here, it came up here, but look, Wyoming, no, not in Wyoming. Okay, I'm going to try to show you why neither of those is correct. <laughs> it's not option A or B, it's C. Well, who cares about stuff? Why on earth would anybody care about this? And I already told you the energy industry cares a lot, because the sediment that was coming from Wyoming at this time in the Paleocene was actually feeding deltas in the Gulf of Mexico. You might have heard of the Wilcox Group. It's a big oil reservoir in the Gulf of Mexico, and it was sourced from, you can think of it as the Paleo Mississippi River coming out and spilling down. So there's been a lot of effort in understanding when and how and where did that sediment go, how big of a volume, and so on. The other thing, which is becoming very popular, is climate modeling. There's a lot of people predicting, and you read one newspaper and it says, we're doomed! If it goes up one degree, we're all gonna burn up. Other newspaper says, ah, it's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> The truth is somewhere in between, probably, like it always is, but how can we predict what's going to happen in the future if we don't actually even understand what led to the conditions in the past? So I already kind of said in Jurassic, a lot of people said it was really warm. There's a lot of data that suggests it wasn't. It might have been cold enough to fall, uh, drop sea level, and create glaciers. In the Paleocene, climate was changing, but if we don't know if it was related to sea level or glaciation, how can we take the data from the past and say, we're going to use this information to predict the future? If you don't know what led to that, you have a hard time predicting the future. Paleontologists care a lot about this. What kind of organisms do we have? You might have heard about recently, there was uh, in the news, this big Cretaceous site in North Dakota called Tanis. And they found these dinosaurs and fish that were beat up by this giant tsunami that came ripping in and destroyed everything in its path. Some of the maps show no seaway. How would that have happened if there's no seaway? Um, there's a lot of other problems with that story. I'm not just picking on the seaway, but um, how can you make these uh, sort of proclamations if we don't even know where the seaway was? Let's look at some outcrops. So we're going to go down around Medicine Bow. You see big sand bodies like that shaped like channels because they were deposited in channels. Well, what kind of channels were they? A lot of the scientific literature, and when JP and I started going out here 30 years ago, all the scientific literature said these channels are fluvial, they were deposited by rivers. Now these are deposits on the northern part of the basin that have been tilted up 
90 degrees. They were originally deposited like this, but then the mountains pushed up and dragged them with it. So what's really cool about that is you can get on Google Earth, and whoop, let me, before I do that, let me tell you what kind of channels it could be. Um, they're not necessarily fluvial. The types of channels that exist in the world are distributary channels, like on deltas. Tidal channels, which are not connected to fluvial systems at all, you'll find them in the Bahamas or anywhere else you have tides. We have estuarine channels and, of course, fluvial channels, but fluvial channels feed deltaic channels. Fluvial channels feed estuarine, they're not connected to tidal, but a fluvial channel can grade into something else. Simply looking at a sand body and saying it's shaped like a channel doesn't tell you if it's a river. And fluvial, by the way, just means river. And this is the Laramie River, because I used to fish it a lot, and I like Laramie River. Uh, but this is what a fluvial channel, river channel, looks like. Distributaries are very different. They're straight, they feed into a body of water. Tidal channels aren't fed by anything except tides. Tides just make them. There's no beginning and end, the tides just create them. And in estuaries, where a river is being backed up by the sea transgressing. So there's subtle differences, but they're important from reconstructing the coastline. So trace fossils help with this, okay? This is the modern Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, Houston is here. This is the Brazos Valley, Colorado Valley. I live right about here. Uh, this is the Trinity Valley. These are all rivers that when sea level fell during the Pleistocene, when the glaciers were piling water up on the continent and sea level was forced down, the rivers cut down, 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 and got wide, wide, wide. When sea level started rising again, it backed up and flooded those valleys. And in the Trinity, that valley is now a bay. So as sea level rises, it fills in the water. These other rivers are filling sediment out just as fast as sea levels rising, so they're not flooding. So it's a balancing act. Sea goes up. If there's enough sediment coming out, it doesn't matter. If there's not enough sediment coming out, the sea comes in. It's complicated. They're all living side by side, but each one is doing something different. It's horribly complicated. Each one has its own type of trace fossils, though. So in the Paleocene, this is the stuff I did part of my dissertation on 20-something years ago. But the types of trace fossils you find, again, tell you what kind of environment you're in. Tidal flats have different traces than deltas, have different traces than estuarine channels, different traces than fluvial channels. This is what's called the transgressive shoreline. So this is a river, and then the sea level started to push back and flooded that river valley, and it creates a very complex assemblage of marine organisms landward. This is where there's a lot of sediment coming out with fresh water. Marine organisms don't like fresh water. If your coastline is building out, you have very simple, low diversity trace fossil assemblies. If your sea level is coming in, you've got a lot of varied habitat and a lot of trace fossils. It's that simple. That's all there is to it. So what I did is I went out and measured rocks. This is about five kilometers, like, I don't know, I don't know how many thousand feet that is, how many miles of rock vertical. Um, but each of those is a sand body. I noted where there was these different kinds of trace fossils, and from that I started tracking them around the basin and making these maps. That trace fossil, which I have a couple of here, is called Rhizocorallium. And by the way, I'm going to be talking about 65 million years ago and about 58. So this is Paleocene, well, well into the age where most maps show no seaway. So most books and papers and museum displays show, show you no seaway. But I'm going to try to convince you there actually was a way. That's what rhizocrallium would have looked like if you could see it clearly. So it looks like that when you see it in the field. If you really look at it, you see two lateral tubes made by a worm or a shrimp, and then the shrimp adjusts himself further back, and then he goes a little bit further back, and then he goes a little bit further back. It's like the clam was going up, these guys go deeper, and they leave behind these distinctive traces. Here's another one crisscrossing it. This entire surface is just chock full of 100% what's called biotubated, just totally destroyed by rhizocorallium, a marine animal living in the Paleocene. That's Reagan Dunn, who's a paleobotanist. She studies leaves, but she was the first one to find these at this site. So she, even though she studied leaf fossils, saw these and thought, that's kind of unique and interesting, and collected the first couple of them. Um, so you don't have to be a trace fossil specialist to recognize there's something funny in this rock that's collected, maybe. Um, by the way, her leaves tell a very interesting story as well. It's a very wet, warm climate, just like you'd expect in Trinity or Galveston Bay. 
So what did the environment look like? Well, this is Matagorda Bay. If you ever want to come visit and go fishing in Matagorda, I'll take you. We'll go right here in a kayak. There's distributary channels. There's things called mouth bars, which is where the sediment gets dumped out of the channel. There's tidal flats, there's bays. Rhizocorallium, the things that make those are shrimp and worms live in this kind of environment. They don't live up in the marsh. They live out in the bay, mouth bars, and flats. So we can get some really detailed pictures of what this environment looked like at that time. Things called parchment worms. This is an interesting sandstone. This is just rock. And even if you're not a sedimentary geologist, you might already be looking at it going, I see some cool features in that rock. It's not just a pile of rock. You might actually see some lineations. And by lineations, I just mean that. Again, if you looked at enough rocks over time, you start to go, wait a minute, that's telling me something. And it's distributary mouth bar, like this. So here's a river channel, or a distributary channel coming out. During a flood, it dumps sediment, it piles sediment up in the mouth. That sediment, if you did a cross section, as it piles up over time, has distinct lineations in it. And they're steeper on the up dip side. And they're shallower on the down dip side. Don't believe me? Go look at the snow drifts right now behind <laughs> any of the trees or snow baffles. That's the same exact process. It's a fluid, air, moving a particle, snow, piling it up. And snow drifts have that distinctive shape. That's the same exact process. Different fluid, different sediment, same process. That's what's happening there in this Paleocene sand body, but there's also something else happening. That's where the mouth bar lives. But these traces are in there, and that little thing here, this distinct pattern, and again, here's where it becomes an art, not so much a science. You can already look at this and just start imagining where you would draw some lines in that, and it might match something like that. Oops. And that's a distinctive trace fossil. Here's a bunch of them all lined up in this sediment, made by a terabellid polyheat worm like that. And here's how it makes it. The little worm burrows down the sediment like that and creates a large chamber. And periodically, he adjusts his chamber outward. The clam went upward. Rhizocorellium went sideways. This thing creates these onion-shaped structures. I'll be darned. Looks just like that. So we can actually start to identify what kind of animal might have made these traces. And again, in the Paleocene, none of this is supposed to be marine. All textbooks, papers, and displays tell you it's totally terrestrial. How do I have these things? Here's the anemone butts. JP and Jaylene Everly and myself found these things. You can see at the base of these rocks, these little bumps, 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 and we looked at them three years ago and said, oh, it must be Smurf butts, because Smurfs have those little tails. Here's what they look like in cross section, a little bump. Here's what they look like face down. And I've got some here if you want to take a look at them. Here's the surface of the hand formation just completely each one of those is a little butt print. Here's bigger butt prints. That's a pen for scale. They're made by anemones, which are also the basis for, if you've seen Return of the Jedi, the Sarlacc Pit, which lives on Tatooine and burrowed in, ate Boba Fett, almost ate Luke Skywalker. Here's how they were made. So anemones burrow down to the sediment with their little mouths exposed, kind of like that worm I just showed you. When storms bring in a lot of sand during, let's say, a big hurricane, all that sand comes dumping in, it covers up little anemones in the ocean. And they say, oh, this is really terrible, and they die. And after they die and decompo decompose, the sand fills in. Just like those dinosaur tracks I showed you earlier. So there's a hole, the sand collapses down, and creates these little plug-shaped structures, just like that. Distinct to marine rocks. They're only found in marine environments. You don't find them in fresh water. Same rocks that you find in all these other marine trace fossils. Where are they found in the world? Well, again, they like tidal flats, bays. Not really channels. They don't like being in the channels. They don't like high energy. They like low energy. And there's a smurf butt. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> Ta-da! That's the other hypothesis. We also have things called ghost shrimp. And I'll move this along because I realize I'm, I'm really going over time here, but we have ghost shrimp that make these pelleted burrows. And again, modern Texas Gulf Coast, this is a cross section of a burrow. You see pellets. Here's a chimney with pellets made by these guys. It's 
when the shrimp is bubbling, those crabs I showed you earlier, they pile up the sediment, hold it together with spit, and stick it on the side of the wall because they're in a sand and a mud that tends to collapse the burrow unless you reinforce it with a chimney. So that's what they're doing. So here's one. Here's some more vertical ones. Here's what they look like in cross section. You can see a little pellet, 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 pellet. Ophiomorphia, it's called. And they live there. We have clams and worms. You get the idea, right? So we're starting to see the same kind of traces that we see in modern environments. The U-shaped worm is uh, a lugworm called Aranicola. The trace fossil it makes is called Aranicolites. That looks a lot like that. Again, a marine animal. This is a bivalve. The bivalve makes a trace. And as the siphon goes up and down, the sediment collapses around it. And if you look at that cross section, you get this onion shape on the surface. Bivalve, it's called siphonicness. And there's our friend again. And they live here on tidal flats. And the interesting thing in the Paleocene is we have mixed fresh and salt water. So it's not all marine, we also have some freshwater things. Uh, freshwater things like mayflies make these U-shaped burrows that are different than the other U-shaped burrows. They're a, a, almost like a tongue. It's called glossopharyngitis. Here's a surface with this really interesting kind of lobate structure. Here's the modern equivalent in Willapa Bay tidal flat made by a polychaete worm. Crab burrows, I've got some of them here. These are made by worms. Fresh and saltwater trace fossils combined. And we see these in sediments like this out in the Ham Basin. Um, these organic rich shales, these dark materials have these terrestrial and marine things mixed and matched. Which sounds contradictory until you start thinking in terms of what's called bayhead deltas. We don't have to get into all this, but a bayhead delta, geologists are not creative. It's a delta that forms at the head of a bay. <laughs> That's Trinity Bay on the Texas Gulf Coast. That's the delta at the head of the bay of Trinity, fed by the river. Let's zoom in on it. Here's what it looks like. So you can launch a boat at Anilak here and just shoot on up the river, come down these channels, and you're on what's called mouth bars. This is what a mouth bar distributary system looks like in the real world. And I've spent a lot of time on a kayak and a boat and shovels and salinity meters taking all kinds of readings out here. And the interesting thing is when we start looking at what lives there, it's mixed fresh and salt water. We have insects, mosquitoes like crazy, midges, biting flies, living in the freshwater ponds in the Delta. If you walk away from the freshwater pond and into the salt water three feet away, there's crabs and shrimp and worms. Problem solved. We have fresh and salt water things living side by side in harmony. And I've drilled cores through Trinity Delta. One of the nice things at Comic and Phillips is we used to go out and drill cores to show our new hires what the sediments look like. Bottom of the core, up to the top, bottom up to the top, looks exactly like the kind of rocks you see in the Paleocene. So the rocks match, the trace fossils match, grain size and everything matches. These are bayhead deltas. We have tidal flats. Again, I'm not going to belabor the point. You get the idea. We have the same kind of ripple marks, the same kind of burrows. There's even fossil logs because during big floods, trees and logs get mobilized and dumped out in the river. So when you start seeing fresh and saltwater things, lots of ripples and lots of logs, probably a tidal flat. There's our friend the Aranicolites, shrimp, and our polychaete worms. If you want to get quantitative and start talking mathematics for fun, I've measured up. These are cross sections of Paleocene channels. The channel was here, then it jumped, then it jumped again, then it jumped the final time. If you measure the thickness and width of these channels and look at the assemblages of traces and sediments and compare it to the Trinity, they match. Same width, same type of grain size, same type of traces. It's a really good analog. So if you went to Wyoming, southern Wyoming in the Paleocene, a Cajun would have been perfectly happy. He would have been in his boat with lots of alligators and shrimp and crabs, plucking his banjo, eating gumbo, life would have been good. The trick with Wyoming and the Cretaceous is mountains were coming up, just like in the Jurassic, but more so, much more rapidly. And here's what Wyoming around Hannah and Medicine Bow would look like at that time. A good analog is the Cook Inlet in Alaska, or anywhere you've got mountains coming up and creating a bay. What that does is it actually amplifies tides. There's always tides going on in an ocean basin. When you compress those tides, 
It's like taking a mouthful of water, and if you just open your mouth, bah, it goes. <laughs> if you pucker your mouth and squeeze it, you go. Because <laughs> you're amplifying that pressure and you're amplifying the current, but pushing it through a small area. As the tide is coming up, it's getting amplified by being pushed into a narrower and narrower area. The tides up here is something like eight meters. It's 30 feet. Now, in the Hannah Basin and the Paleocene, it probably wasn't that high. But even if you have minimum tides in the Western Interior Seaway, we had the Madison Bow Mountains, the Granite Mountains, and the Rollins Uplift creating that very narrow environment that would have amplified tides. And by the way, the channels, the tidal channels, I'm not going to get into this, but we have tidal channels in the Hannah Formation that match almost exactly the size of the tidal flat channels outside of Anchorage. When I worked for Conoco, uh, when I finished my job in the core lab, whatever, I used to go running around the tidal flats, and my compadres would go out and sit one night and have fancy dinner, because that's what old company guys do. And I would roll up my sleeves, like, I'm going to mess around in the tidal flats. Like, what's wrong with you? Why do you want to do science? Let's go drink wine. So in the future, this is some of the stuff that JP and Melissa and other people have been really heavily invested in. It's trace fossils and ecosystems. And I'm just, I'm late to the game and I'm getting there. We actually have crocodilian swim tracks where their little toes kind of scratched along the bottom. We have these bird traces. Here's the white light photograph. Here's a 3D model I made out of it. Here's the actual specimen, if you want to see it later. Um, and we have these mammal tracks made by the big, weird, hippo, bear-looking things slopping around in the tidal flats. That rock has been tilted up at an angle. And the white is just baking flour. We use plain white flour just to accentuate it, because otherwise it's hard to see. This is kind of exciting. This is the first time this type of trace fossil has been found outside of Svalbard. It's the only other existence, uh, the only other record of this thing in existence, the only other one is in Svalbard. Same age rocks, it's pointy toes, Footprints, and by the way, I've got a uh, latex cast of that one. Here's another example. And again, this is a 3D model lit up with elevation to show you what it looks like, and it matches these feet from Paleocene animals called Titanoides. There are very few animals this big at that age that had pointy toes. So when it was described in Svalbard, it's called Dulotherapus, because you've got to name it. Um, and they look just like this. So this might be the very first occurrence of Thulotherapus outside of Svalbard. It's right here in Wyoming. It's just down by Hannah. That's what the tracks look like in place. Again, a 3D model. So I'm still working on this, hoping to publish it soon. Uh, this might be the early Cenozoic record of probe feeding in birds, by the way. That's a that specimen I have here. Here's another specimen, 3D model lit up. And you can see here's toes, 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 toes trampled by birds. Well, that happens on tidal flats. There's uh, Cook Inlet in Alaska, a tidal flat in the Texas coast. Very common when these animals are walking around, but this one, you start seeing these little mark, 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 mark. There's the foot, there's the foot, there's all these little marks. What on earth are those? If you go to Galveston Beach where the sandpipers are running around, there's footprints, but there's these little pet marks where their beaks are going in. That's what this guy was doing in the Paleocene. They've been recorded in the Cretaceous, but in the Cenozoic, uh, there's a lot of common ones like that in the Green River Formation 10 million years younger than this. This is the oldest example of that in the Cenozoic. So that's kind of cool. So in conclusion, trace fossils are pretty important. I mean, rocks are cool, trace fossils are equally important. The Jurassic Sea was forced out. It didn't fill in, it didn't drain. Mountains rose, the land actually rose up. Subtle but important distinction. Finally, the Western Interior Sea stuck around well into the Paleocene. But you have to incorporate trace fossil data as well as just looking at the rocks. And a lot of geologists don't do that. The trick is there's still a lot to discover in Wyoming's rocks. Increasingly, the energy industry is doing computer-based stuff, aerial photography, drone-based. They're not physically getting out and looking at rocks anymore. You're missing all this information. There's no way you can derive that information from drones or from radar or from LIDAR. You've got to get out and look at rocks. Problematically, there's not a lot of field geologists being trained because it's drying up from the oil industry. They're not wanting that skill anymore. So we're seeing this entire skill kind of dying, which is a pity. Any questions? This always happens in science. What sort of pushback are you getting for your ideas? Um, Either for or against? Uh, <laughs> it depends on who you're talking to. For the Jurassic, I submitted a paper on this uh, a year and a half ago. 
it went to reviewers, like papers do. One reviewer said, this is great, fantastic. He hadn't worked on these rocks specifically, he's worked on similar, he's great, no problems with the logic, I love it. The other reviewer has worked on these exact same rocks in these exact same localities, and his model is different than mine. You think he liked it or didn't like it? <laughs> and he got very personal, very nasty. Now, it's supposed to be science. It's supposed to be fact-based, observation-based. We should both look at this and say, that's a marker. It's got a cap. It's got a felt tip. It's even red. If I show it to you and say it's a marker, and you go, no, no, that's a rock. <laughs> How do you have that conversation? So that was with the Jurassic, with the Paleocene stuff. Um, when I first came up with this 20 something years ago, uh, my, you know, almost 30 years ago, my master's thesis advisor at the time had drawn maps that didn't match these. How do you think he reacted when I showed him my maps? The man has not spoken one word to me in 27 years. And I'm not kidding. That was the end. He didn't like any of that. That's it. I'm dead to him. Uh, because my interpretations didn't match his. Now, these are people that have a hard time separating their emotions from observations of science. Most normal people go, wow, I thought that was a marker. It's actually a cigar that looks like a marker. Okay, you know, you can take new data and incorporate it. But it's been said, and it's true, science advances one death at a time. <laughs> yeah. That's true. The scientists get so emotional about their interpretation, and, and it's not supposed to be a belief, but it becomes a belief. As soon as it becomes a belief, you're not doing science. You're done. If you can't take new data and incorporate it, it's over. Rational people look at this and go, I think you got something here. I disagree with this, I disagree with that, but you know, whatever. And if you have an argument against it, that's cool. Uh, if you're just saying, it can't be, because I made a different map, which is functionally what these guys said, there's no conversation yet. So it's actually been very mixed. Um, some people will never be convinced. Some people say, this is great. And other people are like, well, I need more data. You know, so there's always yay, no, and indecisive. And that's what he always is with stuff, you know, unfortunately. It's human beings. Anything else? Do you want to see the traces? I've got them here, by the way. And, uh, Do you have a map of, like, the seaway there in the valley scene uh, in your slide? Um, not in this deck. <laughs> I had it yesterday. You should have been here yesterday. Um, the closest... I remember hearing about, oh, you know what? Let's, um, yes, I can show you. Hang on. I have that capability. Give it one second. This is a big deck. This is yesterday's talk at UW. Um, as you can see, it's a very large file. So, yeah. Here's what I would approximate it look like. Uh, not the whole time in the Paleocene, because there were times when it actually filled in, but at certain times, it was probably connected all the way across. Now, the trick is we have zero data. There's no Paleocene rocks in Kansas or Oklahoma, so you can do whatever you want here, and that's what allows people to say, oh, it was gone. No, it was all the way through. We don't know. All I can tell you is for sure it was here, and for sure it's up here, and for sure it's up here. So we know for positive <coughs> down to about here. From here south, it gets kind of sketchy. And we know it's in Texas. Because um, rocks of this age here are marine, the Deltaic. So it's like connect the dots from here up to here. It's kind of whatever you want to do. Um, so is that thing outlined in the red dotted line, is that what they call the cannonball sea? Yes, is this is all the cannonball. Okay. So in most restorations, you see the cannonball comes down and stops right about here. And in almost every publication you'll ever see, it stops in the Dakotas. South Dakota, maybe even into Montana. Um, it's like right about here. And all the work I've been showing you extends it at least as far down as southern Wyoming. So we've extended it, you know, a couple hundred miles, based only on the trace fossils. There's some other, there's some sedimentary structures, but nobody believed them, so let's just say it was trace fossils. Um, you know, and here's, uh, here's those two examples before. Here's another example of the same time period as the one I just showed you. So this one shows it missing from Wyoming. This one shows no seaway at all anywhere other than maybe in the Dakotas. But I would say this is probably, and over time, here's my estimation of what it looked like from 65 million years to about 55 million. So the seaway, again, it's dynamic. It was flooding. These stars, by the way, are fossil sites. So it started flooding early, and then it really flooded. Then the sediment pushed back and said, no, no, we're not having that. And then actually even some lakes formed because the, 
the, the sediment was not catching up enough to fill in the basin, but the seaway was nowhere to be found, so it formed a lake. But then later on, the seaway came pushing back, said, yep, 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 come back. And then it gave up again, and then we have lakes and rivers. So over time, you know, again, it's not stationary. Over 10 million years in southern Wyoming, that seaway came in and went out. It came in and went out. It's very, it's, it's not easy to identify how and when and where. And this is, you know, again, this question mark said, well, what was it doing here? don't really know. You could connect this if you want, but you don't have to. So, yeah. And by the way, in this one I talked a little bit about, at Wyoming, uh, at Laramie yesterday, I pointed out that in the Wind River Basin, uh, just south and west of us, there's a big pile of sediment called the Waltman Shale. And the Waltman Shale is a great example of what we were just talking about. Do you believe it or not? When it was first described, unbiased geologists looked at it and said, this looks, it looks marine. Is marine organisms, it's dark organic, it's got guacanite, which is a mineral that forms in marine environments. Terrific, and they said it's marine. It's part of the Cannonball Sea. As time went on, people started drawing the Cannonball Sea not extending in the ground, only being up here. And without critically examining the data, most geologists followed and said, well, yeah, if the seaway's up here, that can't be marine, it's gotta be a lake. And so from the 1970s to about today, uh, everybody says, oh, this is a big lake deposit. And they ignore the evidence for marine, they ignore the data for marine incursion. <clears throat> Clear your eyes, look at the marine trace fossils just to the south, and all of a sudden it becomes much more apparent, oh yeah, there's a lake in Venezuela called Lake Maracaibo. At times, there's a barrier that cuts it off from the sea, and it goes fresh. At other times, that barrier is penetrated by the sea, it goes brackish. <laughs> That's not hard. That's what was <laughs> happening in the water. At times, it was cut off, and yeah, it was a lake. At other times, it was marine. But it's not either or, it's over time, things happen, things change. And you just gotta be open to that possibility of, hey, what are other ways of doing this if it's not either or, right? So anyway, Al was happy then, too. He liked that. <laughs> so, anything else? Yeah. Did you work, so you worked for Conoco up in Alaska? I did, yeah. Did you work on the like, Galpine Reservoirs? And yeah, I did. I remember there's a lot of descriptions from Conoco on the trace fossils. Yeah, and uh, James um, McEgrin did a lot of that work on the traces. I remember the lookout well? Yeah, I remember the lookout. I described the Delta? Yep, yeah. I re-described that. Yeah, we, something weird happened. We sampled that for, we wanted to look at the detrital zircons from the core. Okay. And didn't find any in it. It almost looked like um, like sand that was from a, uh, even the sand you put cigarettes out in. Yeah. It was like that clean. It was yeah. Bizarre. And then, um, that must have been like on, that was a, flu, a fluvial almost channel, or was that still offshore? The actual. Great question. Um, that particular well had been interpreted as a bayhead delta because there's no traces in it. But like you're saying, it's very clean sand. Now, again, thinking beyond that, where else do you get a super clean sand with, you know, I showed you that delta, it's got a lot. Of organic material in it. Bayhead Delta said a lot of organics. That sand is very clean. The other, the, a good place to get really clean sand like that is a tidal inlet where you get cross bedding, you get clean sand because all the light weight material or the organics and silicon mud gets blasted out. So if you go to like San Luis Pass in, in Texas, that's a super clean sand. It's almost all quartz, maybe some shell, but it's almost and all quartz. What was the age? That's uh, Sedimanian. So it's one. You know, it's 20. Why do they keep calling it Upper Jurassic? We actually had the. There's different sand, different alpine sands though. Oh, well, I know. They were calling so, the whole thing. I know. Jurassic. I know. And it still do. Yeah. And they know what is it? They give us the right. data showing it wasn't. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah. All right. There's a reason I don't work for Conoco. <laughs> <laughs> and JP was going to make this pun in the intro, and he didn't for some reason. But um, they moved heavily away from doing science. And at, uh, don't tell anyone I told you this, but we as a as a group of technologists. Kind of started making fun and calling it a faith based exploration project <laughs> because they were ignoring the data and just going, you know what? And they call them all Jurassic sands up there. Alpine, uh, the, the uh, Timberline Trail was all called Jurassic. Did you ever see that cutie neck? I don't know. Over? I'm not sure if I have. I think I'm pronouncing it right. Yeah, it looks a lot like um, the, the kind of lookout or right. whatever. That, that annoying A and C face, he's all they need for everything. Yeah, well. And it's so, a lot more complicated than that. And, what we're talking about here is, you know, geologists um, have a nasty habit of uh, when you find different sand layers, if you drill a well and you hit three sands, you call them A, B, and C. 
You drill another well. We call them A, B, and C. Drill another well. They're A, B, and C, and then you connect them all and say, oh, it's all one big sand. You pump fluid into this one, it should show up here. In the real world, you have different sands kind of onlapping and offlapping, and in fact, I got an example of that uh, right here. So in the Hannah formation, this is an aerial view of one of those sands that's been tilted up. If you drill the well here, you hit the sand. Well here, hit the sand. It's the A sand. In reality, if you walk these things out and trace them out, you notice one sand pinches and the other one takes over. Mm -hmm. If you drill the well here, it's A. Drill the well here, it's A. It's actually two separate sand bodies. So what we're talking about is in the ConocoPhillips fields up in Alaska, the Jurassic and Cretaceous sands of different ages offset in different ways, but you hit a well here, that's A sand. Hit another well here, A sand. And it might be one, two, three, and then one, two, three, and they say, oh, it's the same sand. These are maybe Cretaceous, these are Jurassic older. And that happens. And, and once it becomes written up in a report, it's hard to undo because all the managers will tell you, what makes you think you're right if all these other people are wrong? Who the hell are you? They're still calling it Jurassic or Oh, yeah. Uh, well, some... One of the last projects I was doing was uh, actually on the Alpine. We revamped some of that. Some of the Alpine Sea and everything else, we were recognizing some of it was Cretaceous. I don't know if that found its way into the gospel. I've been gone two years, not yeah. seven. I don't know what happened since then. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and the type of environment that happens is this, and we were talking about bayhead bulbs, whatever. These lobes of sand, you know, here's one sand. Here's another one. Here's another one. If you drill the well, though, you'd hit a sand, sand, sand. You think, oh, it's all one big sheet. It's really not. It's different little bodies. And that's common in deltas. Like and they move. move. And they move over time before they finally get preserved. So these environments are really hard to work in. They're really, really challenging. So yeah. Are you concerned about the future? You mentioned field <laughs> geology is sort of going by the wayside. Uh, I'm very concerned. If you have these future possibilities, right. like the stuff you're talking about, are those going to come together, maybe kind of spur more interest in field geology? I think it will when a critical point happens that um, as ability to recover resources declines, there's going to have to become a reckoning where people go, what are we doing wrong? As not, you can't just blame it all on declining resources because somebody's always going to be finding it. And again, fun anecdote from Conoco Phillips, when we were in the Powder River Basin, EOG and Anadarko, two other companies, were drilling the same target sands in different parts of the basin, making money like gangbusters. <laughs> My company said, oh, Anton, we, we leased this property, and we're going to drill here. Uh, it's going to be great, right? And I looked at all the data and said, ooh, I, I don't think so. Like, Anadarko's here. EOG's here. We leased this out in the mud. <laughs> and they said, but well, we already leased it. It's going to be great. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't just me. It was you chemist, you physicist, we all said the same thing. We're like, uh, hey, corporate overlords, you, you got the wrong area. And they said, nonsense. We've got engineers. We'll figure it out. That's the answer to everything in the oil companies these days. <laughs> we have engineers. They drilled the well. It was called Ghost Rider. I mean, I think some of you guys might have heard this story. Um, Ghost Rider was a core. They actually drilled the well and pulled the core. I'm in the technology group. I wasn't in the drilling group. So the drilling group got to see the core, the exploration group saw the core. I'm in technology, I'm the guy that describes the core. A month went by, two months went by. In the meantime, friends of mine at Anadarko and EOG are calling me like, what the hell did you guys do? I said, what, I don't know. I'm like, oh, we heard about your blowout, and you know, nothing there. And I said, I don't know. My company wouldn't tell me. Uh, it was super secret. Everybody else knew about it, but in my own company, they didn't let anybody else know. So the EOG and Anadarko guys knew, because it's all the drillers talking. Get together in the bar. <laughs> when I finally saw the core four months later, it was a target called the Turner Sandstone. Some of you guys might have heard of the Frontier Sandstone. On your drive to Laramie, um, when you take the turn and start heading down, there's that big wall of sandstone. That's the Frontier. Big, thick pile of sand. It's this. <laughs> That's what we wanted. I and other people said we're doing this. When I finally saw this core, it's called Ghost Rider, and it went through the Frontier, the Skull Creek, muddy. Oh dear, there was 20 centimeters of sand. These other companies have like tens of feet, hundreds of feet. So I was like, oh, I told you, science. And they said, your time here is limited. Said, That's fine by me. But it's like that happened over and over again. 
where the scientists, and again, not just me, geochemists, geophysicists, seismic, seismic interpreters, we were all telling the powers that be, uh, follow the science. But their answer was always, but we got a great deal on the acreage. That happened 15 years ago in the Denver Basin, chasing on conventionals. ConocoPhillips was late to the party. Oh, they're all making money. We're going to get that. Hey, that's cheap acreage. Let's get it. And everybody said, why do you want cheap acreage? Well, it's cheap. We can engineer our way out of it. That was 15 years ago. They did this like seven years ago. Three years ago, they did something in the Austin Chalk down in Texas. Same story. And they, sensing a pattern with my former company in the Austin Chalk in Texas, company A is making money here, company B is making money here. Well, we got cheap acreage over here. Oh, God, here we go again. <laughs> Happened again. We got a great aquifer, tremendous water. We're an oil company, not a water company, right? So that's why when they, uh, they, True story, uh, they, they shut down lower 48 exploration because we were terrible. We couldn't find anything. In the Powder River Basin, where everybody else was making money. Green River Basin, everybody else was making money. We couldn't. Um, they said, that's it. Hey, Concho, you guys made a bunch of money in the Permian Basin, right? You guys found stuff? We're just going to buy you. And they bought Concho in 2020. And then they said, ah, we got a lot of people now. We have too many people. Some of you are going to have to go. Layoffs going to be hundreds of layoffs. And we have something called EOI, expression of interest. Half of you people are going to be gone. Now, if some of you want to go, you can raise your hand, we'll let you go with severance. The rest of you are going with your life. And I did that. I said, okay. <laughs> so two, not seven years ago, I said, you know what? I'm good. I've had my fun. You're not listening to me anyway. Give me my money. I'll leave. And so that's what I did. But, um, long way of saying, I do fear for the future because increasingly, especially now with AI, artificial intelligence, and Machine learning. There's such a push in the industry now for machine learning and artificial intelligence. They want to take a core or well log, let the machine learn what it is, and then apply that out there. Like, wait a minute, who taught your machine? <laughs> oh God, that guy? Oh God, you know? Right? The same guy that bought this is teaching your machine? What do you think your machine's gonna do? Um, I know among a lot of researchers and a lot of people that have fled the industry, there was a great fleeing two, three years ago. A lot of us left. Eight months after I left, I got a phone call. Oh, yeah, we got these wells in Norway. Do you want to come back as a consultant? And I said, no, no. <laughs> that time has passed. They were, they're recognizing they don't, they don't have the skills they need anymore. That skill set has left. I don't know how long it's going to be before they try to rebuild it. And right now, when I was talking to people at University of Wyoming, I'm associated with the University of Utah, enrollments are way down. Not just here, all over the place. Student enrollment in geology is down. There's a massive push against hydrocarbons in the energy industry because it's all renewables, renewables. I'm all for geothermal and carbon sequestration. Guess what? It's the exact same stuff you have to understand. It's all plumbing underground. You don't like oil and gas? Great. You want geothermal? Great. It's the exact same sand bodies and the exact same problems you're trying to solve. Uh, and I think once that picks up some steam, so to speak, uh, hey, hey, <laughs> there will be a pushback, but it's going to be a while because enrollment's down. Faculty, frankly, are kind of losing interest and it's getting difficult. Um, yeah. Well, this will tell you about that. Um, and, and some universities, like in the UK, this is already happening, like Leeds University wants no more energy industry money or recruiting coming into the department. Well, how the hell are you going to get funding for an earth science department without energy industry? And in a place like Wyoming, you know, without coal, oil, and gas, who's going to fund UW? Oh, we've got to think about that. And right now, oil companies aren't coming to recruit here because there's not enough students going there <laughs> because there's not enough oil jobs. So it's like the whole thing is just kind of... Um, it'll pick up, I don't know when, and I'm doing my best, that's why I'm taking on an adjunct status at UW. Um, one of the tasks that I've been um, uh, graced with is they want me to kind of help get recruitment a little bit back from the oil industry. I spent 15 years there, I know a lot of people, they want me to start <laughs> calling my friends like, hey, what's it going to take to get you back to UW to recruit? So I'm going to work on that and some of the faculty down there. Um, so we're trying, we are trying. But I just found out yesterday I'm going to be doing that. So it's going to take some time. You know, it's not just me, it's a lot of other people. Um, so it's, it's going to take some time. Though. It might hurt a while before it gets better. <laughs> OK. But I do have the traces here. I've got my flashlight. A lot of times, you know, trace fossils look like a rock until you shine the light just right on. And then you see the, that's a Keep rise going. up. You can't see it. Oh, Mike. There you go. There. Actually, if you want to come see it, you just come on up and yeah. Do it. And like I say, you know, here's the bird tracks. That 
Um, you don't really see them too well until you shine the light on them. There they are. So, but I've got these up here if anyone wants. It's late. If you want to take off, you're not going to hurt my feelings. You want to see some trucks, trails, burrows. Well, thanks for coming, y'all. And thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks so much. And we'll uh, announce it next time we have one of these. Please do.